Hello congregation, Facebook family and friends. Thanks for joining me for this edition of Bible Talk. Tonight, um, the topic and the question that I've asked is, what does Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 really mean? Joshua 1 8 is one of those verses that has been seriously taken out of context and twisted around to say something that it really doesn't mean. And so that's what I want to explore uh, tonight in this edition. But before we do that, let me, let me say this. When you are reading the Bible, when you're studying scriptures, you, you need to be, we need to be very responsible when we're reading and studying the Bible. One of the main rules is, the main rule is that we need to read the Bible in context. We need to understand, um, when we're doing Bible interpretation, what did the writer and what did the author mean at the time that it was written? And then as a secondary application, how does it apply to our life today? That's a standard way of doing it. When you start taking verses here and verses there and start putting them together, you can really get the Bible to say anything you want it to say. And more often than not, it leads down a very dangerous path where you come up with strange doctrines and strange beliefs. And it, and it, it, and it, 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 it multiplies into false gospels is what it does. And there's a lot of people that get snagged by that. And so, as I've been thinking about this, I wanted to just go over the beginning of Joshua chapter 1 to give you some background and show you that by the time we get to verse 8, exactly what it means, because it doesn't mean what most people says say that it means. And I'm speaking specifically, I'm just going to come around and say it, about the prosperity gospel people. It's also known as name it and claim it. It's known as word faith. Um... It's, you know, you sow it, you own it. There's all kinds of phrases that, that are used for the same kind of gospel. And it's talking about that you can be rich and you can be successful and God wants you healthy and all of this kind of stuff. Joshua 1.8 is one of the verses that these people use to try to manipulate you into believing that that is the gospel that God is preaching. But I'm here to show you tonight and again, let me preface it before we start, that with anybody you listen to, any preacher, any Bible teacher, always check out the Bible for yourself. Those who follow me, you see that I post a phrase that says, be a Berean. The Bereans, you can read about them in Acts 17, verse 10 and 11. They were people that searched the scriptures daily because they wanted to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. Don't ever trust, because we're all fallible. So don't ever trust completely any preacher, any pastor, any Bible teacher without doing research on your own. You're doing yourself a great disservice. I think sometimes that's how some of these people get snared into some of these phony gospels and some of this false stuff because they don't check it out for themselves. So having said all of that, I'm in Joshua chapter 1 tonight. And we got we have to get the context is what I was saying earlier. Now, in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. We read about that. It's very clear. We read about that in verses 5 and 6, that Moses died and no man knows his sepulcher to this day. Okay, so there we have the context. And as soon as we get into the book of Joshua, this happens right after Moses' death. Now, you have to remember that Joshua was like his lieutenant his minister, his, his, his guy in training. Joshua is like his right hand man. And so we start in the book of Joshua in chapter one, verse one. It says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou, and all this people unto the land which I do give thee to them, even to the children of Israel. So there we have the initial context here. Moses is dead. Joshua now has the responsibility of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Remember, Moses was able to go up on a hill and he was able to see the promised land, but God would not let him enter. That's, a, that's a, another topic for another time. Suffice it to say that here is Joshua, 
this young warrior for the Lord, and he now has the responsibility of bringing the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Most scholars estimate that the children of Israel at this time were around 2 million people. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of people. That's a huge crowd. So imagine Joshua receiving these orders from God. So let me read a couple more verses so that you get the full uh, order and command from God. Let me start with verse 2 again. I'm going to read 2, 3, and 4. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou, meaning you, and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses." from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. What God is doing here is he is re-emphasizing to Joshua the geographical area that he had promised the children of Israel. And so... When we look at this, I can't imagine what was going through Joshua's head when he realizes this, his mentor, Moses, is dead. God comes to him and says, you're going to be the one that's going to lead my people in there. And, and he turns around and he sees this sea of people, probably around two million, most scholars think. And he's now got to lead these people in there. He had to be pretty... Um, needing some strength. And we're going to see how God is going to strengthen him and how this will play into verse 8. Okay, so there's the, there's the context now. Now look at verse 5, because this is, this is important. Verse 5, God says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Now keep that in mind, that is important. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. That is a promise from Almighty God that no matter what Joshua was going to come up against. And as you read the book of Joshua, you know that once they got into the land, they had to battle all the people that were already there. There was battle after battle. You know about that. We know about the walls of Jericho. We know about the dividing the land among the 12 tribes. It wasn't just a cakewalk. It wasn't just, okay, the gates are open and they can walk right in. There were years and years of conflict ahead of them. And so Joshua was being told, whatever is going to go happen, I'm going to be with you, I will not forsake you, and there's not going to be anybody that's going to stand in your way. That is important. Verse 6. This is the first time that God's going to use this phrase. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. That whole promise with the land started back in Genesis 17 with Abraham, where Abraham was told about the land that his in, his inheritors would receive, his progeny would receive. And so the first time God is saying, be strong and be of good courage. Courage is really important and be strong. He has to be strong in the Lord to be able to do and accomplish this massive feat that God has given him to do. And so you're going to see the word courage come up three times in this passage. And it, that is important because God is building his, his servant Joshua up. He's building him up to bring him in to the promised land, to encourage him, to strengthen him for what's going to happen ahead of time. Joshua is going to need his wisdom. He's going to need his skills. He's going to need his, his battle skills. He's going to need to divide all the land. And he's got to do all of this. But God said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Okay, are we starting to see the picture here? All right. Verse 7. God says it again. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now, that is important again. Look at what God is saying. Okay, remember, it's context. This is not what you're going to hear. You're not going to hear this part of it from the name it and claim it 
folks from the prosperity gospel because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit their idea of the gospel. It doesn't fit. But look what God is saying. Be strong and be courageous. That's the second time he told Joshua that. Why? Why is he telling him to do that? That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. What is all the law? What is he talking about? The books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was the law. That were the books of the law up until that point. Now you see what Joshua is being told. The only way that he's going to be able to observe everything is if he stays strong in the Lord, if he is courageous in the Lord, if he stays focused on the Lord. Okay? All God is talking about right now is you're now leading the people and I need you to pay attention to the law that Moses gave you. Let me read that again because it's really important to understand what verse 8 is all about. Verse 7 again says, Be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Not pick and choose what you want, Joshua. All the law. You do all of it. You got to maintain all of it. Everything that God talked about, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Here's a further instruction. Turn not from it to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou go. When you're focused on something, if you turn to the right or to the left, you take your focus off whatever it is you're looking at, right? If you do that while you're driving in a car, you can get in an accident. If you're not focused on what you're doing, you can go down a wrong path. When we, when we are following God, these are instructions not just for Joshua. They're instructions for you and me tonight as we're looking at this passage. God is saying that he wants us to be in his word, to read his word, to study his word, and not to variate to the left or to the right. Remember, I use this example a lot, but it kind of fits here. You know, when Peter got out of the boat, he was walking on the water. As long as he was looking at Jesus, he was fine. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus and he started looking at the storm around him, what happened? He started sinking. He looked to the left and he looked to the right. God is saying, don't do that. Don't turn your eye to the right or to the left. Why? Because, he says, you will prosper wherever you go if you don't turn to the right or to the left. Okay, so Joshua has a very clear command. Here's what I need you to do, Joshua. You're going to lead the people into the promised land. Now, you need to be strong. You need to be courageous. You need to be brave. You need to obey everything that's in the law that Moses told you about. All the books of the law. So, in other words, you need to tell the people as well. And then, if you do that, you will be successful. You will prosper wherever you go. Now, prosper, he is not talking about material wealth. He's not talking about riches. He's talking about you will be, you will be six. I'm going to be with you. You will prosper. In other words, you will successfully make it into the promised land. You will divide the land up and you will conquer the people that are there. That's what God is talking about here. So now we get to the verse that has been twisted, taken out of context, and frankly abused and used in the wrong way. And it's manipulated some people, and it just shouldn't be. And it's something that really upsets me because um, you, can, you, can't, you can't mess with the Word of God. You just, you can't do it. You can't do it. I was guilty of it. As a young Christian, I will just tell you, I was guilty of it. I would see a verse here and a verse there and say, oh, so that's what it means. The Bible is very clear that that scripture is not for any private interpretation. I can't believe one thing about a passage and you believe the same passage, but you think of it a little different. One of us is wrong or both of us is wrong, but both of us cannot be right. There are guidelines in looking at scripture. We have to be able to compare scripture with scripture. You have to see context first and then see how it applies to the bigger picture. That's the way it works. And so now let's get to verse 8 because this is where some of the gospels and some of the preachers out there turn criminal in my estimation. Verse 8. 
The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. The book of the law. What book? The Pentateuch. The five books of Moses. That's what we've been talking about. Okay. Yes, Mary. God gives us the meaning to scripture. That's right. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That sounds like a weird... What's he talking about? What's, what's God saying? Don't let the word of God leave your mouth where you're not sharing it anymore, where you're not reading it anymore, where you're not telling your children anymore. You remember, there are generations that don't tell their children anything. We saw what the Israelites... They didn't bother telling their children the great things that God had done. God is warning him, don't allow the book of this law, don't, shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, Joshua, don't forget about it. It's important. It's critical. Next thing, but thou shall meditate therein day and night. Okay. Does God literally mean day and night, that that's the only thing that Joshua or us should do day and night? No. God is not meaning that literally. I mean, can you imagine if all of us, all we were doing was meditating on the Word of God day and night? Nothing else would get done. Now, I'm not belittling Bible study and Bible reading. I do it every day, every single day, faithfully, because it's my passion. It's my calling. But by meditating on it day and night, here's, here's, here's a good example. You know, in Psalm 119 verse 11 it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. If you don't have the word of God in your heart, if you don't have it memorized, if you don't meditate upon it, then how do you know when you come up against a situation or Satan tempts you or someone else throws something at you, you need to be able to stand on the word of God and say, God says that's wrong or God says we shouldn't do that. If you're not meditating on the word, you're unprepared and Satan and his minions and people who are unsaved can come and attack you and get you to fall into sin if you're not standing firm on the word of God. Do you hear me? And so he's telling Joshua and us tonight, first thing, the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Don't get to a point where you don't share it with your children, parents who are watching, or grandparents, or if you're an aunt, uncle. Don't neglect sharing the word of God with people. Don't neglect it. Don't let it depart out of your mouth. Secondly, meditate on it day and night. Why? Because that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written within. Okay, we got to deal with that phrase now. If you meditate on it day and night, if you're not allowing it to depart out of your mouth and you're forgetting about it, by remembering it, by memorizing it, by putting it into practice, by not just talking the talk, but walking it, by allowing people to see that you're a Christian, that you're a believer, that you take the Bible seriously, then what does it say here? That you may observe to do all that is written therein. All of it. That means we are to go into all the nations, like the Great Commission tells us in Matthew 28, and make disciples of all people and baptizing them. We are to we are we are to carry out what the Lord has given us to do. We can observe to do all the things therein. But you see, if you're someone that just looks at the Bible on Sunday while the pastor's preaching, and then it collects dust the rest of the week, shame on you. If if you're just someone that occasionally will look at the Bible for five minutes, but you have three and a half hours to watch a football game, shame on you. If you don't take the word of God, see, this is the word of God. This is the only book that God wrote. And he's giving Joshua instructions then, and he's giving us instructions now that we better be serious about his word. We can't just, it's not, the Bible is not an afterthought. The Bible is God's word. There is no other book that can tell you how the world began, why it's in the mess we're in now, and how it's going to end. No other book. None. Okay? The Bible cannot be, uh, I'll get around to it when I can. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No. You're right. God is not playing. God is not playing. Spiritual discipline. That's exactly what we need. We have to decide. How important is God's word to us? Is it worth five minutes a day when you have time, when you can fit it in? Or is God a priority in your life? Sometimes you have to sacrifice things to
to do other things. We all have 24 hours in a day and all of us have a schedule to keep. Some of us have children to take care of, et cetera, et cetera. Make the Bible a priority in your life. These are the instructions here. It says the book of the law. Don't let it depart out of your mouth. Don't get to a point where you stop preaching it or teaching it or sharing it. You may not be called to pastor or to preach, but you can certainly share it with your children or sit with them and read stories from the Bible. Or if you meet someone that's not saved, to share the good news of the gospel. We should meditate on it day and night. That's how we get to know the Bible know God's will for our life. We should know the scriptures. You know, in Peter, it talks about, I think it's first Peter talks about, we should always be ready to give an account for those things that we believe. Well, if you don't know scripture and you don't spend time in the Bible, how do you testify? How do you give an account? You can't. And you look bad. You look bad. That's right, Mary. We have to esteem the word of God more than our necessary food. Spiritual food is the most important. Spiritual food is more important than physical food. That's just a fact. But let's finish his verse. To all that is written therein. Okay, now here's where the prosperity gospels, the name it and claim it folks, take this out of context. Because you don't hear the first part of the verse usually. You just hear this part. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Do you know that this is the only verse in the entire New Testament that has the word success in it? Well, if you take the word success and prosperous and you put it in modern terms, what does it sound like? Yeah, yeah. You can ask God whatever you want and you'll get it. You want a big car? You want a lot of money? Nice job? Beautiful wife? Yeah. You want perfect health? You just name it and claim it because God says that you can have success and you'll be prosperous. So go out and get that car. Go out and buy that house. Go out and get the best looking wife. You can have your best life now. Are you kidding me? No. Listen to me. Are you kidding? That, see, this is what upsets me about it. You take a verse. You take part of the verse. And you, you meld it with something else in the Bible. And you come up with a whole new doctrine, a whole new gospel. And then you go out and you teach that to people. And it has nothing to do with what's going on. Okay? Let's read this verse again. Now remember, Joshua is being given instructions before he brings the people into the promised land. This verse has nothing to do with the prosperity gospel, with money, with houses, nothing. Okay, if you think about it, when the people entered into the land of milk and honey, they had to fight their way in. They had to fight the Hittites and the Amorites and so on. They had to fight their way in. It was years before they actually settled. Does this verse sound like a prosperity gospel to you that they're going to just walk in and have everything? Come on. So let's read verse 8 again in context. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. Joshua, you will be successful coming into the promised land. I will protect you. I will be with you. Your way will be prosperous because the land that I promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is now coming to pass. Now you're going to enter the promised land. You're going to divvy out the land among the tribes. You're going to settle into the land of Canaan. You will be successful. You will be prosperous. Let's look at verse 9 and finish it up. Have I not commanded thee to be strong and of a good courage? That's the third time God said that. Be strong and be of good courage. Does it say be rich and buy a Cadillac? Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. You know why he says don't be dismayed? Because once they get in the land, they got a lot of hurdles to jump over. They're going to be big people. Remember when he sent the spies out to look and then some, oh, I don't know, Joshua, I don't think we can get in there. And you have the walls of Jericho that come down. You have people that were already in the land, but God had predetermined that the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, was going to his children, Israel. But they were going to have to fight for it. Their lives would be lost. And so when we look at verses 1 through 9 and we see the initial command of God, he's lifting up Joshua. 
He's preparing him for what's ahead. And he's saying to Joshua, be strong, be courageous, follow the law, do what Moses commanded you to do. That's all of the law. Don't forget to, to preach it and don't forget to share it with the people. Meditate on it. As long as I am in front of you, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. And if you do all these things, Joshua, then and only then will you be prosperous and have great success. That's what the passage means. That's what that verse means. So I don't know if you've ever been taught this before, if this is something new. But this is one of those verses, verse 8, where you just hear about being prosperous and being successful. And it just irks me to know when I'm not making judgments and I'm not dropping anybody's name. But you can kind of tell, you know, who's preaching this nonsense. And they're taking it out of context. I learned that the hard way. I'll just share that with you before I close. Many years ago, when I was a young Christian, I went through every kind of denomination and belief you can imagine. I went through the faith healers movement and the name it and claim it people. I went through all kinds of movement, but every God kept bringing me back to the Bible. And through years of study and years of God tearing down old beliefs and replacing them with accurate beliefs, I still read the Bible and study it every single day. And I'm still learning every day. I've been a Christian for 33 years. I, I don't even know the Bible, comparatively speaking. I know very little of it, but I keep striving. And the more you get to know the Bible, the more you meditate on it, the more you share it, the more you hear it from others you get to a point where you can figure out pretty easy, you can hear and you can see pretty easy when you're being fed a lot of malarkey, when you're being fed nonsense, when it can't, when what is being preached and taught to you cannot be backed up by scripture. You can tell, you can tell real easy. And so I, I pray that this Bible talk has been an encouragement to you. Thank you for those who are on here. I know some of you jumped on late and I will repost this in a few minutes so you can go back and watch it if you can. Let me encourage you. Be diligent in your Bible reading and your Bible study. Don't be too quick to come to a conclusion and say, ah, so that's what it means. We need to compare scripture with scripture. And sometimes God doesn't always open our eyes on a passage or on a verse right away. Sometimes it takes a while. But be diligent, the same way that he told Joshua. Meditate on the word day and night. Day and night. And so I want to thank you for joining me for this edition of Bible Talk. If this has been a blessing to you, if you've learned, if you've been inspired to read the Bible, if you've been convicted of something, please feel free to share this video with uh, others. It has nothing to do with me. I don't want credit, don't need credit. I don't have to... It doesn't matter. What's important is that this is the word of God going forward. God promised in Isaiah 55, 11, that his word would not return void. It will reach those people that he wanted to reach. And so if you have been blessed by this time tonight, and this has, has meant something and encouraged you in some way, please share it with someone else that could, that could need to hear the word. Maybe someone else that was confused about the passage. And let's be diligent in studying our Bibles. We only have one Bible. God only talked to us in one, in one book, and that was in scripture. And so, um, as we're closing out tonight, I want to thank you for joining us for Bible Talk tonight. I hope that you learned something, and um, let's go forward, be diligent in reading our scriptures. Thanks for joining me tonight. God bless you.